Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientists monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Marina Picciotto will present Nicotine Receptors in the Brain, Implications for Addiction and, and Depression. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $394 million to fund more than 5,700 grants to more than 4,700 scientists around the world. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Picciotto. She is the Charles B.G. Murphy Professor of Psychiatry and Professor in the Child Study Center of Neuroscience and Pharmacology, as well as Deputy Director of the Tavley Institute for Neuroscience at Yale University School of Medicine. She's a member of our Scientific Council, was a 2016 Foundation Distinguished Investigator Grantee, a 2004 Independent Invest Investigator Grantee, and the 1996 Young Investigator Grantee. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Picciotto's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. I'll present as many of the questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. And now, I'm in I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Picciotto. Marina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. I will be taking you on a tour through uh, nicotine receptors in the brain. And uh, I saw from the sign-up uh, information that we have a broad audience from people who are interested scientists and interested lay people to those who are experts in the same field. So uh, please be patient if the uh, information is a little bit too uh, advanced or too basic, and I will try to keep the pace uh, enough for everybody. So to start, I want to outline the problem. Even though we have, as a society, agreed that, this is, that smoking is very dangerous and bad for human health, there are still more than 350,000 smoking-related deaths in the United States every year. It remains the major cause of preventable death in the United States, although obesity is, is not far behind. And it is still the case that the majority of smokers would like to quit, but they've relapsed repeatedly. And if you, are, if you try to quit with absolutely no help, only a small percentage of quit attempts will result in cessation a year later. So we still have a major need. As you can see from this slide, there is uh, obviously, there are many reasons that smoking is dangerous. We all think about lung cancer when we think about smoking-related deaths, but there are many, many other sequelae consequences of, of smoking, including heart disease, lung disease, stroke, and other cancers, all of which contribute to an enormous morbidity from smoking. So now let me outline the problem from the scientific standpoint. How do we understand why people start to smoke and why they continue smoking? Well, first of all, we know now that there are a large number of receptors for nicotine, and I will talk a lot more about this in a minute. We also know that those receptors are expressed in many, many br different brain areas. So the effects on the brain are very complex. Again, I will talk more about this over the course of the talk. And finally, there are many different reasons that people smoke. Certainly, people report that they smoke because they enjoy it, they get pleasure, or that they have withdrawal symptoms when they stop. But people also report that they smoke to focus their attention when they're trying to do a difficult task, or that they smoke to control their appetite. And others report that they smoke because they feel that it helps them with their symptoms of anxiety and depression. 
And it's clear that since there are many, many different reasons that people smoke, it's important to understand as many different brain mechanisms that might be uh, altered as a result of smoking as we can. So first of all, why do people smoke despite negative health consequences on health? We know that nicotine, like other drugs of addiction, alcohol, coffee, uh, painkillers, cocaine, opiates, is indeed addictive. It's reinforcing. That means in animals, if you give animals nicotine and you make them work for it, they will continue to work for it and they will continue to do whatever they were doing when they received nicotine. We know that it drives ongoing smoking because if you take nicotine out of cigarettes and you offer them to a, a, a dependent smoker, individuals will stop smoking. Not that they'll stop smoking entirely, but they will certainly switch away from the brand that doesn't have nicotine in it. Nicotine, however, is only one of more than 4,000 chemicals in tobacco smoke. We know that it is the primary addictive substance. As I mentioned, if you take it out of cigarettes, people will stop smoking or switch. However, there are more than uh, there are more than just nicotine. There is more than just nicotine in tobacco smoke. We know that there are other substances that make nicotine even more effective. Cigarette companies, of course, have found that changing nicotine levels is the best way to make people smoke more. But they also can change the availability of nicotine by changing its uh, its acidity. Uh, they can do other things to manipulate how much nicotine is delivered from tobacco. Despite all of these other chemicals, I am going to focus on nicotine today because it is the chemical that is essential for the addictive properties of smoking. Now, how does nicotine work in the brain? For those of you who are non-scientists, we can think about nicotine as a key and its receptor, the proteins in the brain that it binds to, as the lock. When nicotine binds to these receptors, it fits into a pocket that is the shape of nicotine, and that changes the activity of the proteins to which it binds, and it changes the activity of the nerve cells on which those receptors are expressed. So when we, oops. so here's the shape of nicotine. It's actually not the normal uh, binding factor for nicotine receptors in the brain. We did not evolve these receptors in order to roll up a tobacco leaf, set it on fire, and put it in our mouths. In fact, there is a neurotransmitter that is a chemical that's used for communication between nerve cells that's called acetylcholine. That is the normal binding factor for the receptors for nicotine in the brain. So normally, there are cells in the brain, nerve cells, that make the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And when they want to communicate with the next cell, they release that acetylcholine. It diffuses across and it binds to the next cell activating that cell. Nicotine comes in and hijacks those receptors. It binds to exactly those sites that acetylcholine normally binds to, and those receptors now are activated, and nicotine will bypass the normal process to activate the cells on which the nicotine receptors are found. We know a lot about the structure of these nicotine receptors. We know that they make a pore so that we can uh, pass uh, ions, that is, we can change the activity of, um, of nerve cells by passing ions across their membrane and activating them. We know that these receptors are five-member rings. So I'm, I'm turning this receptor on its side, so you look at it from the top in these diagrams. And what you can see is that the receptors are five-member rings that are made up of a whole family of proteins that are very similar, but different enough that they have slightly different properties. Nicotine or acetylcholine binds in between two of these subunits of the receptor. And because each of these subunits contributes some structure in order to bind the nicotine or acetylcholine, the identity of those subunits makes a big difference. So for example, if you have some types of subunits, you can get tighter binding of nicotine or acetylcholine. There are some kinds of nicotine receptors in the brain that have all five members of the five uh, of the of the ring exactly the same. These are called homomeric. There are other family members that need at least one alpha and at least one beta to make a functioning nicotine receptor. And each of these different members of the family can alter the brain in different ways. 
because they are found in different brain areas and they're also more or less likely to bind tightly to nicotine and also because once nicotine or acetylcholine is bind, bound, each of these different types of nicotine receptors can turn off more or less rapidly. This is just a computer um, generated picture of what we know about the structure of nicotine receptors. Just as, as a fun fact, here's where the receptor is uh, crosses the cell membrane. Here's that large space where nicotine and acetylcholine binds. Each of these lumps is one of the five members of the ring. And that hole in the middle is the channel shown here through which ions flow that allow this receptor to change the activity of the nerve cells on which it's found. This is the family tree of all of the members of the um, family that have been identified so far. And each family does slightly different things. This blue family is involved in making, uh, in, in uh, allowing nerve cells to communicate with muscles. So your voluntary movement depends on these receptors. The amount of nicotine that's in smoked tobacco isn't enough to activate these, but these actually are activated by much lower concentrations of nicotine and they are found in the brain. And this is the family that's important for the addictive properties of nicotine. We also have ways of looking at these nicotine receptors in the uh, awake, live human. We can take uh, radio labeled tracers that look a lot like nicotine or acetylcholine, and those can bind specifically to the nicotine receptors in the brain. This is a side view of a human brain showing different brain areas outlined. And anywhere which is th that is colored, even these dark blue parts, uh, are showing absolutely selective binding of nicotine in the brain. And what you can't see here, but I can tell you, is that there is no part of the brain to which there is no, the, to which nicotine does not bind selectively. That is that nicotine binds all across the brain uh, with uh, different um, receptors. So what do nicotine receptors do in the brain? We have them, um, we smoke and we can activate them. What is their normal function? Well, one thing that we know is that there's a part of the brain called the ventral tegmental area, which I will refer to as the VTA for the rest of this talk. And it sits here in the middle of the brain. And we know from many experiments, first in animal models and then in humans, that this part of the brain is essential for the rewarding properties of all drugs that are abused by humans. So that counts for opiates, uh, cocaine, and other uh, and amphetamine, uh, cannabinoids, and of course, nicotine as well. These cells that sit in the ventral tegmental area use a neurotransmitter called dopamine, which you may have heard of. Dopamine is essential for these rewarding properties. It's even been the molecule of the year on Time Magazine at one point or another. And when dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, or VTA, is released in a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, then animals will continue to work for whatever made that happen, and humans will continue to abuse whatever drug made that happen. And so we know that this part of the brain is very important for addiction. And that's absolutely the case for nicotine as well. We know that there are nicotine receptors, and this is now a very simplified brain with one nerve cell. This is the cell body of a nerve cell in the ventral tegmental area that uses the neurotransmitter dopamine and its terminals, its foot, that is found in the nucleus accumbens. And when nicotine binds to nicotine receptors on the bodies of these nerve cells, it increases their activity, it excites them, it sends an electrical signal down to the, VT, to the nucleus accumbens, and dopamine is released and signals reward. There are also nicotine receptors here on the terminals, that is the feet of these nerve cells in the nucleus accumbens, and they alone are already enough to increase dopamine levels in the nucleus accumbens. So we know that nicotine receptors are very well placed to excite these dopamine neurons. But there are many nicotine receptors in the VTA. And what you can see is that, in fact, this is the shape of the VTA, that there are some receptors that are very selective for the VTA. This mustache shape are the dopamine cells. And there are some nicotine receptors that are really only in the dopamine cells. And then there are other nicotine receptors, this type here, that's expressed almost everywhere. But you can still see its expression at high levels here in the dopamine cells. So how can we find out which of these nicotine receptors are important for the reward signal that initiates smoking? 
Well, the work that we've done in our lab is with mice that uh, are genetically modified so that they either have less or more activity of different kinds of nicotine receptors. And I'm just going to walk you through one story today. This has been something that has been done by many laboratories in the field now, either to reduce or increase the activity of these different nicotine receptors, to do it in the whole brain and body or only selectively in particular brain areas. And as a result, we now have a very good idea of how to map that very complicated family tree of nicotine receptors onto specific behaviors. And here is the example of the beta-2 subunit of the nicotine receptor, and I'll talk a lot more about it. Just You'll hear me say beta-2. It's really not important what its name is, but what you can see is that this is a receptor that binds very strongly to nicotine throughout the brain. This is a slice through the mouse brain. And when we get rid of this one subunit of the whole family, it's enough to completely get rid of all of this very tight binding of nicotine in the brain. So it's essential. And if you look back at our family tree, here's beta-2. It is the most widely expressed of, it's the most widespread of these nicotine receptors. And again, it's here in the ventral tegmental area, that place where the dopamine cells have their bodies. And as I mentioned, if we take a mouse that is normally expressing beta-2, we can show that there's tight binding of nicotine, very low levels of nicotine, consistent with how much you would get from a cigarette. And when you genetically engineer a mouse without that beta-2 subunit, all of that binding is gone. I should say that those mice actually look very happy and very normal, which sort of surprised us. We thought that they would be more essential. But it turns out that these receptors are important for shaping behavior only under conditions where you really need to be precise. So in fact, the mice can live just fine without them. However, they perform better on a whole lot of behavioral tasks when they are in the brain. Now here's just uh, a, a cellular example of what nicotine receptors do on those dopamine cells. If we measure little electric currents in one dopamine cell, we can see that nicotine increases this, oops, this current in these dopamine cell bodies, and we can measure it in um, a cell body from a mouse. If we take these same concentrations of nicotine and put them on a dopamine cell from a mouse that doesn't have the beta-2 subunit, what you can see is it does not induce any currents in these dopamine cells at all. So we know it's essential for exciting these dopamine cells. We can look at levels of dopamine in mice that are normal here or in mice that don't have uh, the beta-2 receptor. And what you can see is that nicotine increases the amount of dopamine that is released from these cells when we measure it in that nucleus accumbens brain area where it should be um, normally acting if the animal gets nicotine in its brain. And what you can see is if we get rid of the beta-2 nicotine receptor, all of that ability of nicotine to increase dopamine is gone. So what does that do to the behavior of the mouse? We can't actually ask the mouse to smoke. Uh, it, it's uh, not allowed to since we are smoke-free in our facilities, but we can ask it to work for nicotine. We can ask it to poke its nose for infusions of nicotine, and if it does poke its nose for those infusions, we know that it likes the nicotine. So that's what we did here. Here are mice that are normal that are getting nicotine, and they're poking their nose 90% of the time in the right place in order to get nicotine. Mice that are just given um, a, uh, a non-nicotine solution, so just a saline solution, will not poke their nose. In fact, they'll decrease their nose poking down to chance. And mice that don't have the beta-2 receptor will look like they're getting saline solution rather than nicotine, even though they're getting nicotine for each infusion. They simply do not want to work for nicotine. So it's enough to take away this one subunit out of all of them in order to get rid of that rewarding and reinforcing property of this addictive substance, nicotine. Now that uh, first set of data that I showed you are from mice that don't have nicotine, this beta-2 uh, nicotine receptor throughout the brain in every cell. But we can now ask, is there a particular need for this receptor in the dopamine cells themselves? And that was done by a group um, led by Jean-Pierre Changeu, with whom I worked as a postdoctoral fellow, and Uwe Mascos in his lab showed that he could take these knockout mice without beta-2. He could put beta-2 back only in the dopamine area, the ventral tegmental area, 
And then he could show that he could rescue the ability of mice to work for nicotine, and that's shown here. Here is how normal mice will work for nicotine. They increase their work for it over time. This is normal mice that, uh, sorry, this is knockout mice that don't have beta-2. I showed you those kinds of, uh, that kind of lack of performance already. But if he puts them back only in those, uh, in the ventral tegmental area, then these mice will work for nicotine again. So that gives us a brain area, a particular target, and that's important for trying to develop medications to help smokers quit. So let me summarize what I've told you so far about addiction. And this is uh, just a slice of the data that has been um, developed by a very large field at this point. We know that beta-2 combines with other alphas and that those receptors allow uh, currents to flow through cells in order to activate brain cells, ner nerve cells in the brain. And this is important because the fields now identified the alpha-4 and beta-2 receptor, along with another subunit, alpha-6, as being absolutely essential for the initial rewarding effects of nicotine. In addition, you've seen that nicotine receptors on dopamine cells can stimulate the release of this rewarding neurotransmitter, leading to um, an increase in its levels in the nucleus accumbens. And together, we now know that beta-2 um, nicotine receptors have to be expressed in these cells for the addictive properties of nicotine in mice. And then in step three, the activation of the dopamine system leads to the ability of mice to work for nicotine, but also to smoking in humans. And this is a real success story when we think about the ability of basic science research to lead to effective treatment for behavioral disorders in humans. Because these animal studies that I've just described to you are simply one slice of the, of, the, of, the, of the evidence that was necessary in order to develop specific uh, therapeutics that bind to the alpha-4, beta-2 nicotine receptors to activate it a little bit, but not as much as nicotine. And that has um, led to the development of Renaclean, which is also called Chantix, which is a very effective smoking cessation aid in humans. So now I'm going to switch gears completely. So I've talked about addiction. Why else do people smoke despite knowing that there are negative effects on health? Well, one thing that I mentioned is that people who are um, struggling with anxiety and depression disorders are more likely to smoke. Whereas now we're down below 20% of the US population that smokes as adults, 40 to 60% of patients with depression diagnosis smoke. So it is smoking is very highly overrepresented among individuals with anxiety and depression. We know that major depressive disorder is a chronic relapsing illness. It has a huge cost to both individuals who are depressed, but also their families and to society as a whole. About 8 to 12 percent of people will experience major depressive disorder in their lifetime, and the prevalence in women is about twice that of men. And we do have a great existing therapies for some individuals. It's wonderful that there are drugs such as tricyclics, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac and others, um, non-classical antidepressants, and also electroconvulsive therapy as well as uh, cognitive behavioral therapies. And these do work for about 50 to 70 percent of patients. But there are 30 to 50 percent of patients that are not uh, remitted completely uh, using current therapies. So there's still a real need for new treatments for major depressive disorder. So how do we know that um, these nicotine receptors might be involved in uh, the effects of, of depression or how, how might they contribute to depression? There have actually been clinical trials of nicotine patch, particularly by Salen Pasquale and, and colleagues who have done uh, double-blind studies in non-smokers, showing that patch can actually act as an antidepressant in non-smokers. However, this hasn't really been uh, a clear indication that nicotine can be antidepressant because if you deliver the nicotine a different way, for example, intravenously, at that point, there have been studies that show that this rapid nicotine infusion can produce symptoms of depression or anxiety in non-smoking, non-depressed patients. So how can it be that nicotine delivered in these two different ways might increase and decrease depre depression symptoms in humans. 
Well, we know from these molecular studies that I've already started to talk to you about that the way that nicotine delivers either opens the channel or closes it. So for example, intravenous nicotine is very fast. It gets to the brain quickly. And because that nicotine binds at high levels to a whole bunch of receptors at the same time, it activates all those receptors. It turns them on all together and it induces an excitation of the brain um, in, in areas that are responsive to these nicotine receptors. In contrast, nicotine delivered through a skin patch is very slow. It results in much, much lower levels of nicotine getting to the brain. And it actually doesn't open all of the receptors um, at all. In fact, overall, it can stabilize a what's called a desensitized state. That is a state that now can't be activated by high levels of nicotine or by the normal neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So it turns off these receptors. So knowing this from biophysical studies of nicotine receptors, we made a guess about why different kinds of nicotine delivery might be antidepressant or, uh, or increased depression symptoms. We think that maybe blocking nicotine receptors to, present, to prevent the action of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the brain is antidepressant. And if this is the case, then smokers who are activating their receptors when they smoke, but then decreasing the activity over the rest of the day as these receptors close and desensitize are going through activating and blocking cycles all throughout the day. And this is consistent with what smokers report. They say that while they're actively smoking, that the uh, tobacco smoke is decreasing their anxiety and depression symptoms. But if we, if um, researchers give people a, um, a device, a handheld device to say, when are your symptoms high and low? In fact, overall symptoms decrease when people quit, but at different times during the day during active smoking, people report that they're less anxious or more anxious. So this is actually not a completely new finding. When we started to find out these effects of nicotine, we went back into the literature and we found that uh, a psychiatrist, uh, Janowski and his group had reported that acetylcholine, as I mentioned, this is the the real normal target for these nicotine receptors in the normal brain, that increasing acetylcholine in humans could induce symptoms of depression. And this was true in people with no history of depression, but also people who did have a history of anxiety and depression disorders. So what he and his colleagues did was to give humans a blocker of the breakdown of acetylcholine so now the acetylcholine stayed in the brain for longer, its levels were higher, it was more likely to activate its receptors, and those individuals reported that they felt depressed and anxious. So we wanted to um, confirm that this might also be the case in the models that we were looking at. We know that rodents actually increase their acetylcholine levels in uh, particular brain areas when they are stressed. So what you see here is the level of acetylcholine in a part of the brain called the hippocampus immediately after they get stressed. And once they, the stress is gone, those, those levels of acetylcholine go back down. So we thought perhaps we could model these Janowski studies by giving mice the same blocker that increased depression symptoms in humans. And so can we do this? Yes, we can give that same drug, physostigmine, decreases the breakdown of acetylcholine, and we can increase these stress-induced behaviors that in mice are reversed by antidepressants that work in humans. So all you're seeing here is an increase in immobility in the face of a swim stress in mice, and that is coordinated with the decrease in activity of the breakdown enzyme for acetylcholine. And in fact, we can reverse that by blocking both nicotine receptors and other receptors for acetylcholine. So what you can see here is that mice that have too much acetylcholine are more immobile, but if we block their nicotine receptors or other acetylcholine receptors or all the acetylcholine receptor subtypes, that we can reverse that response to stress. However, what's really interesting is that we can use this model in mice as a model for human response to an antidepressant that doesn't work through acetylcholine at all. So we can increase this response to stress by blocking acetylcholine breakdown, 
but we can reverse that by giving these mice Prozac, which shouldn't have much to do with these acetylcholine receptors at all. So what we have here is a mouse model that represents a similar behavior as seen in humans, that is an increased response to stress, and that is reversed by an antidepressant that works in humans. So does this happen in the brain? I've just shown you some drug effects. We can now go in with genetic engineering and decrease the breakdown of acetylcholine selectively in the hippocampus, which is that brain area there where I told you stress increases acetylcholine levels normally. And when we decrease the breakdown of acetylcholine only in the hippocampus, we get more anxiety-like behavior in a couple of different models in the mouse, and we get more depression-like behavior in three different models of depression-like behavior in the mouse. And that includes very non-physiological stresses. We would never um, have uh, swim stress, or we might have swim stress, but swim stress probably wouldn't lead to depression in humans. But we can also imp um, have a model of social stress in mice, where a bully mouse that um, beats up a, a, a mouse that has too much acetylcholine can result in more defeat behavior, more avoidance of social interaction than a mouse that has normal levels of acetylcholine. So now we have a model in which we can say we can evaluate the effect of too much acetylcholine in a number of different paradigms that are responsive to human antidepressants. So if increasing acetylcholine signaling in mice and humans induces stress-related behaviors, does that mean that when people are depressed, they have more acetylcholine in their brains? Well, that's a study that we did in collaboration with our colleagues who could do imaging of these receptors. So I've shown you this family tree before. These are all the nicotine receptors that we know. The tracer that we use binds to this beta-2 receptor that I've already talked to you about with respect to depression, uh, with, uh, to, with respect to addiction, I'm sorry. And this tracer binds right here at this binding site for nicotine or acetylcholine and marks where those uh, nicotine receptors are in the brain. And what we can do is look at the brain of a control non-smoker. We can't use smokers because the nicotine in tobacco would interfere, would compete with this tracer and you wouldn't see binding. And what you can see are brain slices. Here's through the side, the front, the top of a human brain. Um, this is a lot. These are not slices. These are images of this bound radio tracer. And a control non-smoker has binding throughout the brain. But what you can see here is that there's a little bit less of these warm colors in this the brain of this acutely depressed non-smoker. And if we quantify that, uh, sorry, if we quantify that, I will show you later, there's quite a bit less binding of this tracer in the brain of someone who's acutely depressed. So how do we think about that? If depression is associated with increased acetylcholine, what do we expect to see when we use this radio tracer to image nicotine receptors? Well, normally in the brain, there is some acetylcholine signaling. We use it for uh, tasks that are involved in, um, in attention. We use it for uh, tasks that are involved with responses to stress. So there is going to be some acetylcholine signaling in the brain. So when we introduce this tracer that binds to the same site, there aren't going to be all of the sites available for it to bind, but there should be some. In contrast, if there's a lot more acetylcholine in the brain when someone is depressed, more of these sites might be occupied by the transmitter acetylcholine. So now when we introduce the tracer, there are less places for it to bind on these nicotine receptors. And that's exactly what we think happens in a depressed human subject. So this is a quantification of how much of this tracer binds in control subjects throughout the brain. These are different brain areas. And how much of that tracer binds in the brains of someone who is acutely depressed. And of course, this could be due to competition with acetylcholine, which is what we think happens. But there could be other reasons. Maybe there are just fewer receptors for nicotine in the brain of depressed people. Well, we could ask that question. So what we did was we went to a brain bank and we took brain tissue from people who had died when they were acutely depressed, mostly from suicide, or people who had died um, from under normal circumstances who were the same sex and about the same age. And when we asked, are there fewer nicotine receptors in the brain of someone who died when they were depressed? The answer is no. In postmortem tissue, there's no difference in the number. But 
we could repeat the experiment that Janowski did and artificially increase the amount of acetylcholine in the brains of healthy people and ask, do we now see the same signature that we see in the brain of someone who's acutely depressed? And this was an experiment done by Irina Esterlis here in our department. And what she did was to give that blocker of acetylcholine uh, breakdown. She imaged people before they got the blocker. That's how much binding of this tracer is in five different individuals. And when she gave them the blocker of acetylcholine breakdown and there was more acetylcholine in their brains, it competed with the tracer and we got the same type of decrease that we got in the brains of people who had not get, gotten any drugs at all, were non-smokers, but were acutely depressed. Irina also repeated this experiment that was first done in patients with major depressive di disorder, unipolar depression, and she imaged the state uh, of people with bipolar depression when they were actively depressed, and she saw exactly the same signature. There was a decrease in the availability of these receptors for binding to this tracer that binds to the same site as acetylcholine. So this suggests that perhaps binding that site, uh, blocking that site might in fact have antidepressant effects in humans. And there have been a couple of trials where a blocker of nicotine receptors, not the site where acetylcholine binds, but the entire pore of every single nicotine receptor that we know could augment um, the antidepressant effects of things like Prozac in individuals who are not responsive. And there were a couple of different trials. Unfortunately, when that broad blocker was uh, used in a very large trial by AstraZeneca, they didn't see an effect. And so the full blocker of every nicotine receptor may not be the ideal target for using as a new antidepressant. So can we use these same mouse models to try to get a more specific target rather than just every nicotine receptor? And we can use these depression and anxiety-like behavior models to identify perhaps the sites in the brain and the particular receptor subtypes that might be important for these behaviors. So what we were able to do is to re uh, use that broad blocker in the mouse, and there we could give the mouse relatively high doses, so we knew we were blocking all of the nicotine receptors. And in that case, in these mouse models of antidepressant efficacy, we could see a decrease in the response to stress, a deep, more antidepressant-like behavior. But we could also use a much more selective agent, one that, like varenicline, which is used for smoking cessation, could actually decrease the activity of these receptors but not block all of them, and also that was more selective for the subtype that we think um, might be important for these behaviors. And that compound was just as effective as blocking every nicotine receptor. So the question is, um, can we combine that compound that's more selective, it's called cytosine, I should say, and can we show that it has some convergent effects with antidepressants that are already used in humans? And again, we'll go back to Prozac. If we use a sub-threshold, that means not enough of this compound cytosine to have an antidepressant effect on its own in mice and we combine that with a dose of Prozac that's not effective on its own, do the two together have an effect that's visible in these mouse models of antidepressant efficacy? And again, we're using two different models here just to show you that in the mouse we can um, have a broader effect than simply in one test. And when we take a dose of this very selective uh, nicotine um, blocker, cytosine, and we combine it with a less than effective dose of Prozac, the two together now decrease depression-like activity, both in this tail suspension test and also in this social interaction test, which is resistance to bullying in the mouse. So we know that these uh, drugs have a similar behavioral output, the selective drug cytosine and the selective drug non-selective drug mecamilamine can both act like antidepressants in the mouse. Where do they do this? We can look for a neurobiological signature in the brain for a place where the two drugs work in a similar way. And what you can see is that we can measure activity of different brain areas using a biochemical assay. And in one particular area, the basolateral amygdala, we can see a decrease in activity with both of these drugs. So that gave us a place where we thought maybe these drugs are acting. So when we went into the mouse brain, we already knew that increasing acetylcholine in the hippocampus 
could increase symptoms of anxiety and depression-like behavior, but was that the only part of the brain? Were there nicotine receptors in the amygdala that were also contributing to this effect? So what we did was to infuse these blockers directly into the amygdala, and that alone was enough to decrease these depression-like behaviors to have an antidepressant-like effect in mice. So in addition to the hippocampus being important for inducing these uh, effects of uh, increased acetylcholine, we could have effects of nicotine blockers here in the amygdala as well. And we could finally use molecular genetics to ask which of the different receptor subtypes might be acting in the amygdala. We used two different nicotine receptor subtypes, one called uh, the alpha-7 receptor. That's the homomeric receptor where all of the subtype subunits are the same. And we also used that receptor that's important for addiction. And when we decreased the expression of either of these different nicotine receptor subtypes in the amygdala, we could reduce the activity of this structure, suggesting that this brain area, which we know is absolutely essential in humans for fear and for response to stressful uh, images, and that are, is essential in mice and rats, as well as other model organisms for anxiety-like behaviors, stress responsivity, we can reduce the activity of this brain area by decreasing the activity of these receptors that are important for acetylcholine signaling and that also bind to nicotine. So I'm going to stop there and summarize what I have um, talked about. This is work that's still in progress. This is a complicated slide, but I just want to walk through a, a few things that I've told you and some things that we have published but I did not have time to talk about today. So we know that in the hippocampus, if we increase acetylcholine signaling, we get increases in uh, depression and anxiety-like behaviors. And we think that's due to a normal input of acetylcholine neurons that are in a part of the brain called the basal forebrain complex that are very important for exciting the hippocampus. And we think about this as something that's very important for cognition, learning, and memory. And our current model is that the reason that acetylcholine in the hippocampus is important for uh, anxiety and depression behaviors is because it increases the focus on negative stimuli in your environment. So certainly we have good things and bad things that happen to us every day. Those of us who are depressed or very anxious are likely to focus on and remember the worst things that happen, the stressful things, and we think that acetylcholine in the hippocampus may be part of that process. We've identi identified receptors for nicotine in the hippocampus that are important for those effects, as well as receptors for other neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is the target of Prozac, that work together to affect the activity of the hippocampus in um, response to acetylcholine. I've also shown you that even in the absence of stress, we can change the activity of the amygdala by decreasing the activity of receptors for nicotine in that structure. And we think, in fact, that this is very different from the hippocampus, whereas the hippocampus is involved in these cognitive responses, perhaps encoding these negative experiences, we think the amygdala is really important just for responses to stress. Do you find something stressful? If you decrease the activity of the amygdala, you are less likely to find uh, stresses in your environment difficult to deal with. And there are other parts of the brain that I haven't talked to about at all, including parts of the brain like the cortex, the prefrontal cortex, it's especially important in humans for allowing us to veto all of the different things that are happening in deep brain structures that are important for evolutionary responses to stress. And if we can have cognitive control over those deep brain areas, we can actually decrease the consequences of stressful uh, environmental uh, events. And finally, there's parts of the body, the um, the, the stress axis, HPA axis, that involves both the brain and the body's responses to stress, hormonal responses to stress, cortisol, other transmitters that we know are important for exciting the body, getting it ready to fight against something that might be dangerous. And we think that acetylcholine is important for coordinating all of these structures that have to be in a delicate balance for us to respond appropriately to stressful events and not to overreact and be more attentive to the negative rather than the positive consequences of our behaviors.
So I'm going to stop there by winding up. And to restate the problem, we have a lot of nicotine receptors. There are a lot of parts of the brain in which they're expressed, and there are many reasons that people smoke. However, the good news is that we've been able to use a combination of basic science studies, molecular genetics and pharmacology in animal models, as well as human studies with therapeutics that are safe in, in people to make good progress in dissecting the nicotine receptor subtypes and the brain areas that are responsible for specific nicotine-dependent behaviors that drive smoking. Indeed, targeting these nicotine receptors is a success story for rational drug design, and it's resulted in the most effective current uh, treatment for, for smoking. The challenge is that existing uh, therapeutic agents used in humans are not as specific as some of the ones that can be used in mice. In fact, agents that are even selective in mice, like cytosine, which I told you about, appear to have different selectivity for human receptor subtypes. So there has been quite a bit of, uh, of drug design in humans, and I believe that there will be more selective drugs um, coming out. Some have been developed for schizophrenia and can be repurposed for other, um, other indications. For example, uh, perhaps some of those drugs that are, uh, have been developed for cognitive dysfunction or other disorders could be used for anxiety and depression. So our hope is that medications targeted to these highly specific nicotine, subunit, nicotine receptor subunits could be useful not only in helping to motivate smokers um, who smoke for reasons other than addiction reinforcement, such as self-medication of anxiety or depression symptoms, to quit and maybe they can also be useful ultimately to treat non-smokers who have anxiety or depressive disorders. And to finish, I want to thank my lab members and our collaborators who've done um, most of the studies that I have um, presented today. In addition to lab members who've gone on to other jobs who were involved in the initial studies that I, I showed you. Um, as as uh, Dr. Bornstein mentioned, we've had a lot of funding from NARSAD, from the BBRF, that has allowed us to take the nicotine receptor story in the direction of anxiety and depression disorders, which we would not have been able to do without it. We also get um, funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the National Institute on Mental Health. And I want to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer a few questions because I think we'll have some time. Yes, we do. And uh, Marina, first of all, thank you for your presentation, which was a lot of information, but really you were able to do it in a way that's user-friendly for scientists and for a lay public. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for the research that you've been doing on this important field. I, I want to um, start with, you made the point, and I think it's very important about how basic research could then bring about clinical interventions. And you use the example of, of Chantix um, mm -hmm. for that. Um, as you, as you uh, spoke about the, the significantly higher rate of people who um, smoke, uh, who have anxiety and depression, and that also is similar for people with uh, schizophrenia, um, what guidance can you give a person who has one of those conditions um, and smokes, but really has it hard, you know, finds it very, very hard to stop smoking. Well, luckily there are other things that don't directly target the nicotine receptors alone that are used for therapeutics in humans and particularly for humans, uh, for people who, who struggle with depression. In particular, there's an antidepressant that was originally um, called Welbutrin, for depression, it turns out that it targets not only um, serotonin like Prozac, but also it targets uh, dopamine, so it increases dopamine in the brain, and it also blocks nicotine receptors, at least to some extent. And when Welbutrin was first prescribed for patients with depression, some individuals came into their primary care physicians and they said, the funniest thing happened, I do feel better, less depressed, but I also don't feel like smoking anymore, so I was able to quit. Well, when they did clinical trials with Welbutrin, they found that it was effective in decreasing smoking, even in individuals who were not actively depressed. And so it is now marketed under a different name, um, particularly for, um, for uh, smoking cessation, and the name is escaping my memory at the moment. Um, 
but I will come back to it. But that antidepressant is likely to be ideal for individuals who struggle with um, depression and whose depression symptoms may in fact increase when they quit smoking. It should help decrease the craving for smoking, and it should also help the anxiety and depression symptoms. And because it does have an aspect of its function, which is to decrease the activity of nicotine receptors to block them, I think that may be part of the reason that it is both effective on, for smoking cessation as well as for um, anxiety and depression. Very important information. Um, and the, the generic name of Welbenstrin is bupropion, and Zyban is the Zyban. Is the that's the one. That's that right. For, Thank you very much. Conversation. Yes, yes. Yep. Very important uh, information. Um, and by the way, I, I am not. Um, I don't work for any of these companies, and so I I, I am giving you the information on these um, brand names, but um, they are not an endorsement in any way. Right. You're explaining the science and, and what people need to know potentially clinically, but obviously right. with their own um, uh, with their own physician. You should work with your own clinicians, exactly, your physician. Yes. The, um, I want to ask you about e-cigarettes and how it fits mm -hmm. into all of this, since we've seen a lot in the press about them, and while there's been reports of decrease in um, use of traditional cigarettes, uh, there's been a substantial increase as e-cigarettes have become more popular. And how does that fit in uh, in terms of the delivery of nicotine? That is a terrific question, and it's certainly something that I've watched um, happen much more quickly than almost any um, cultural phenomenon that I've ever seen. So uh, as, as recently as probably five years ago, you wouldn't see e-cigarettes very very. Um, very often, and now any store that you go past has big signs in the window, e-cigarettes, vaping, there are many vape shops. So on the one hand, for people who are actively smoking combustible tobacco, it is very likely that e-cigarettes are safer, they are less likely to result in lung disease, and switching from uh, tobacco, smoked tobacco to e-cigarettes is probably a very um, good way to reduce harm. However, my concern is the following. Um, we've been really incredibly successful as a, for, in public health campaigns to decrease smoking. We've gone in the U.S., for example, from around 60% of the population who smokes to less than 20% over my lifetime. That's an amazing saving of human life. And so now we have e-cigarettes that are perceived as very safe, and they're perceived as safe also by teenagers. So adolescent smoking has also gone down tremendously over the last several decades. But as e-cigarettes become uh, very available and their perception is um, that they're products that uh, anyone can use, uh, more and more teenagers are, are using them. So there are two issues there. One is that um, e-cigarettes still are not quite as efficient at nicotine delivery devices combusted tobacco. So it turns out the reason that tobacco is so good at getting nicotine to your brain is that tar acts as a particle that carries the charged nicotine deep into your lungs and it's absorbed there in the alveoli of the lungs and goes straight up to the brain and so it can reach very high levels very quickly. Most other tobacco products uh, do not efficiently carry uh, nicotine down into the lungs so it's absorbed across the inside mucosa of the mouth. And then it goes first to the liver where some of it's degraded and by the time it gets to the brain lower levels are present and the peaks are much more rapidly, uh, are, are much less rapid. And so what that means is that some teenagers who are using e-cigarettes may find that it is rewarding, may find it um, pleasurable, but then will get uh, dependent and addicted and will find that, in fact, combusted tobacco is even more effective and will become dual users or maybe even switch. So my concern there is the erosion of this public health campaign that was so successful. But perhaps even a bigger problem is that even if kids don't switch from e-cigarettes to combusted tobacco, we've seen in studies we've done both in mice and in collaboration um, with Leslie Jacobson's group in humans, that nicotine during development does very different things to the brain behavior than it does in adults. So nicotine in developing adolescent brain and developing fetal brain changes signaling in the cortex, and it seems to change it for a really long period of time. If the mouse is a model, then 
exposure to nicotine during early development results in increased branching of cells throughout the cortex all the way as late as we can see in adulthood. And we believe that that's very important for uh, selective attention. So if you increase all of the activity of these brain areas that are important for focusing your attention, what you get is long-term difficulty difficulties in both sen in, in many different types of sensory attention. We can model that in, in mice, and that's also been seen in human teenagers. So a, a key point is we now know that the brain is still developing into the 20s. So yes. you, you know, you, we may have in the past thought that a 15-year-old has a developed brain. The brain is still developing. So hugely pointing out a very important and dramatically into yeah. the early 20s. The, yeah. uh, so I think that's a, a, a very key point. Uh, one of the concerns is that um, smoking cigarettes in younger people could lead to other substance misuse and abuse and addiction. And mm -hmm. I'd like you to speak a little bit about that as well. Sure. Well, there's very good evidence in human epidemiology that um, kids who start with smoking are more likely to move on to other substances, including marijuana and other drugs. Um, the possibility is that there are neurobiological mechanisms. So once you start stimulating those dopamine cells with nicotine, they are primed. They are um, you. You. Uh, your brain is uh, now used to having that reward signal. Um, more frequently, and therefore natural rewards in your environment may be a little bit less uh, rewarding. And so people may, uh, particularly teenagers, may go on to substances that are even more effective at stimulating the dopamine neurons. There have also been a number of basic science studies that have shown that nicotine can change the likelihood that other stimuli, like other drugs of abuse, uh, can activate the dopamine system. So you may now have a, um, a molecular change in those dopamine cells that makes it more likely that you'll find other substances rewarding. But overall, I think that there are multiple reasons that uh, humans go on from smoking to other substances, uh, including the perception of uh, safety once you've tried one uh, drug that is thought to be dangerous and you find that the legal drug is okay, that you might be more likely to try other substances. But it is absolutely clear that it is, um, in humans, much more likely that kids who smoke will move on to other substances than kids who've never smoked. So an important take-home message is that um, we need to make sure that kids continue to receive the message about the danger of, of traditional cigarettes end of the e-cigarettes and try to minimize um, the use of, of those um, delivery systems. I agree. I think it's important that the message go out to, um, to kids, especially that these new um, vaping devices are not necessarily safe for a developing, for an adolescent brain. The, well, these are all very important uh, messages. And I want to, again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the ongoing work that you're doing that is having such an impact. I also want to thank everybody who joined us today. All of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So please consider making a contribution by, by, by visiting our website, bbrfoundation.org, or calling our 800 number, 800-829. 8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion or would like to share it with a family member or a friend, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Jeremy Veenstra Vanderweel from the, the Division Director of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Professor of Psychiatry at Columbia University will present Pathways to New Treatments in Autism Spectrum Disorder. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, November 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.